Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Moral Speaker Pelosi is meeting with Democrats, teeing up a trial of Donald Trump that could begin as soon as this week. And then Trump's verdict will depend on those hundred senators who take the oath, just as they did in the Bill Clinton trial. But there is one other figure with special powers over how this trial runs, because the person who typically presides over the Senate, the vice president, is removed during an impeachment trial. Given the obvious conflict of interest, the vice president would literally take office if a president were convicted. So instead, the chief justice shall preside over impeachment trials, a role so important, it's actually the Constitution's only reference to the chief justice. And that means this trial will be run by John Roberts, a conservative Bush appointee who Trump blasted on the campaign trail. Just as Roberts turned out to be an absolute disaster. He turned out to be an absolute disaster because he gave us Obamacare. Roberts votes with conservatives most of the time, but Trump seized on his high profile vote in that Obamacare case to appeal to Republicans who wanted a different result. Now, Supreme Court justices often try to avoid politics, so it's a sudden change for any of them to be thrust right into a battle over whether to keep or evict the sitting president. When former Chief Justice Rehnquist presided over the last impeachment trial, he often seemed uncomfortable with the new attention. He laid low, he took cues from the Senate parliamentarian, and donned a black robe emblazoned with gold stripes, an homage to a character from a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, which he would later reference in a letter, noting that in that big role overseeing the trial, he did nothing in particular and did it very well. Fair enough. But even doing nothing can be harder than it looks when you add political fireworks and live TV coverage on every channel. That's something John Roberts may have in mind as he prepares to take up the same task as his former boss. Roberts, interestingly, clerked for Rehnquist once upon a time. And in his last foray in a big televised event, swearing in President Obama for the first time, he was facing a large in-person audience, a large national and global audience, and Roberts flubbed the wording of the oath in the Constitution. Barack Obama took the oath administered by Chief Justice John Roberts. Here you have the perpetual A student, John Roberts. The Chief Justice went without notes. The guy's never made a mistake in public before, and he thought he could administer the oath by memory. And actually got the oath wrong. Now, in total fairness, anybody could make this kind of mistake. The Constitution's text says, faithfully execute the office of the president. Roberts moved the word faithfully later. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the pres office of president of the, the United States. The office of president of the United States faithfully. Not a big deal, but Roberts did have to return to the White House the next day to redo the oath. So there was no legal ambiguity whatsoever. That's how seriously they took the wording and execution of that oath. A contrast to, to some Republican senators at this very trial who've announced they intend to violate their oath on impartiality. But what else do we know, really, about Roberts? His time in the Reagan administration includes advocating robust powers for the president and the power to keep internal executive matters secret. 
from even the Senate. So while President Trump has blasted Roberts over Obamacare, he might like the way that Reagan era Roberts had arguments on executive privilege. Maybe try to apply them to John Bolton because Roberts wrote about taking whatever steps were necessary to ensure that the general opening of files to Hill's scrutiny would not become routine. And he criticized a record keeping law as pernicious, warning against any transparency that could allow a congressional staffer to visit the Reagan library to see any internal White House deliberative document that they wanted to see. Well, that's interesting stuff. In that role, Roberts was, to be very clear, he was a lawyer writing a memo for the executive. When he started to head towards the Supreme Court, he stressed that no one is above the law in comments that undercut recent claims by Trump and Attorney General Barr. I believe that no one is above the law under our, under our system, and that includes the president. I have been arguing cases against the executive branch and frequently arguing cases uh, for the proposition of deference in favor of the legislature. Judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. It is a limited role. Nobody ever went to a ball game to see the umpire. Now, Roberts has not previewed his approach to this trial. He has a new year-end report on the federal judiciary in general that says we should each resolve to do our best to maintain the public's trust that we are faithfully discharging our solemn obligation to equal justice under the law, a goal that could apply to being a judge or juror in this trial. And that's where Roberts' role differs from the courtroom where judges have the last word. In an impeachment trial, the Constitution treats the senators as both jurors and judges, which actually makes some sense because these are not random citizens serving on a jury. They are elected lawmakers. So to the extent that a law would bind what the judge rules, these are the individuals who can always literally change the law with enough votes. So with that in mind, consider something you're going to hear a lot about at this high stakes trial. Consider rule seven which holds that the Chief Justice rules on all questions of evidence, including relevance and materiality, but notes the Senate can overrule those decisions, noting that any Chief Justice ruling stands, quote, unless a senator asks for a formal vote on it. And while Roberts usually works with his eight colleagues in private, plus his clerks, in this new trial format, it all comes down to basically him and one rules advisor, the Senate parliamentarian, Elizabeth McDonough, a 20 year veteran, of nonpartisan government posts. So Roberts can follow her expertise and lead, or he could just go his own way. Chief Justice Rehnquist rejected the parliamentarian's advice over whether to formally call the senators jurors. And Roberts can also lean into the precedent, or he can lean away from jumping into these hot debates that are basically coursing through the Senate right now. Of course, the largest one, the biggest controversy, is about witnesses. And Republicans could hope that Roberts just stays out of it. But he could also potentially put more pressure on them. If he rules on the precedent in the last 231 years of American history, the Senate held 15 total impeachment trials and it heard witnesses in all 15, every single one. It's such a fundamental point that even Donald Trump's defenders used to make it. In every trial that, that there has ever been in the Senate regarding impeachment, witnesses were called. Certainly not unusual to have a witness in an impeachment trial. But, well, the, the House managers have only asked for three witnesses. I think that's uh, pretty modest. Yes, a real trial has witnesses. And while Donald Trump may hope for something easier, to paraphrase Nas, imagine going to court with no trial. The integrity of the Senate and the Chief Justice may turn on whether this will be a real trial after all. It is Tuesday. The 14th of January of 2020. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. A small dash, a mere scant pinch of smoked hot Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It always does. Well, we have a snowy mix here today at the Mothership in Southern Oregon, Rogue River to be exact or precise. And uh, that's fun because I was wonder wondering if we were going to actually see a winter. And once you start wishing for something, you may get it. So uh, that's fine. We have a snowpack uh, at elevation that has been 
uh, staying in place, which is good. We don't want that snowpack melting. So, uh, looking for a wonderful spring and summer. We'll see. Australia is pretty much on fire, and we had been on fire for several years here in this part of the country. And, uh, uh, boy, Fox News, Mur the Murdoch chain, they are going to donate what I, I think an initial, uh, 300 or three and a half million, something like that. And then more in that amount, uh, coming in stages to help firefighters and uh, the relief effort because of the fires in Australia. Of course, you know, Murdoch comes from Australia. Which is quite odd in that they are donating this money to help the firefighters in the effort to uh, stop these fires because they have been front and center and even today de denying climate change as any cause for anything that's happening in the world today. And they are doing it specifically because it benefits right wing corporatist polit politicians worldwide. And they have been working hard for, <laughs> I got to say, a generation at least. So it reminded me of the arsonist firefighter goes out and sets the fires and then comes and saves the day. So here you have Murdoch and his business essentially starting fires. And now they're going to throw money at the problem and say, look at us. We're being helpful. We just want to help. Yeah. Okay. There's something psychotic there. And that arsonist firefighter uh, gets punished and sometimes has to go to a hospital. Well, Barnes and his lawyers have been trolling pretty well. I like how they troll. Uh, lots of uh, pictures being posted of Lev with a lot of different Republicans. I keep saying, even way back, <laughs> even before Trump was elected, I said, follow the rubles. Follow the rubles. And now that we know how much money from Russia went into the NRA, yeah, while their little red sparrow was doing her work. <laughs> yes. And uh, that money was then laundered. Those rubles were then laundered and then handed out Two Republicans, they weren't handing them out to Democrats. You know why? Because we Democratic types <laughs> go to the cops. We go to the cops and say, look, I, I, I think somebody's trying to bribe me. Or look, somebody broke into my uh, business and stole a bunch of records. Whereas the Republicans say, don't go to the cops. You know, on the more local level, that is one of the uh, arguments I get from uh, these. Uh, I, I, I don't want to say they're all proud boys. I like to say proud boys because they're fighters, you know, brawlers. <laughs> but uh, there's some Lyndon LaRouche, Rand, Ron Paul, libertarian types who are just they're just profane and they're loud and they bully and they push around. But, you know, if you ever got them from behind the keyboard, uh, they probably wouldn't be able to exist in the uh, construct of the world that they're constructing. Let's put it that way. I used to have an old adage that uh, those who are the uh, loudest voices for anarchy tend to be the least capable of surviving it. So I suspect that's the case here. But regardless... Uh, there's, I, I mentioned about this, uh, little brain teaser about, uh, going up and just slapping someone because you disagreed with their political opinion and there's nothing that the other person can do about it. And uh, of course I would say, Oh, you slap me. I'm not going to slap you back. I'm going to call the cops. And apparently to the law and order types of yesterday, Going to the cops is really a, a snowflake thing to do. We can just work it out ourselves. Look, you come up and slap me. I'm old enough to know now that retaliating in that fashion doesn't get anybody anywhere. I'm calling the cops. That is why they are there. You don't like it? Too bad. We'll just go to court and figure it out there. Huh? 
So maybe that would stop you from slapping me because of my political opinions. You know, I'm not slapping you because of your political opinions because I fear going to jail. That's <laughs> the difference between the left and the right. I don't slap you because of your political opinions because we live in a representative democracy. All right? If that other side feels that it's just so great to be able to slap someone because of their political opinions and then be able to back it up with a gun on their hip and say, I determine what polite conversation is, so you shut up now. The argument I'm getting is that I should carry a gun and I should determine what polite conversation is while that person has a gun and they're determining who polite conversation and we're going to shoot each other. That's anarchy. That's lawlessness. That's the Wild West. We don't live in those times anymore. And I got to tell you, back in the day, this romance of the gun wasn't as uh, widespread as you think. In fact, there were laws in a lot of these towns that said, you give the gun to the sheriff when you step into our little town. And when you leave, you can have your gun back. Because they had a lot of problems with a bunch of wahoos, yahoos, shooting it up. So the reason we have law is because I shouldn't have to carry a gun on my hip to determine what polite conversation is among the group. Because someone else might have a gun who wants to determine what polite, what polite conversation is to them. So you slap me. I'm calling the cops. I don't slap back. I never did. I'll take it. And then I'll take you to court. I mean, after all, this is America. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Well, that was, of course, Ari Melber at the top, breaking it down about uh, Trump's nightmare impeachment trial. And maybe... John Roberts, who was described by Trump as an absolute disaster. Because he didn't toe the line 110%. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, uh, I, I, I am not going to put any great faith in John Roberts. He's a toady like all the rest. Maybe, maybe he has some sort of idea of legacy. And I don't mean personal legacy. I'm talking about the legacy of history looking upon our time. Maybe he has that type of awareness. And that might determine his course of action. It might. But I don't put any great faith in it. The Trump administration made it harder for employees to sue corporations over franchise wage law violations. The chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee is disappointed and frustrated that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo refuses to testify in today's hearing about not just attacking Iran, not just killing Soleimani, but also about the jetliner that Iran has taken responsibility for shooting it down, albeit by mistake, and albeit because they were put on a war footing by you-know-who. Pompeo, as Secretary of State, is refusing his constitutionally mandated duty because, hey, <laughs> we Democratic Party members are the enemy. And a Wisconsin law could stop Trump from skipping out on his campaign rally bills. He owes a lot of money to a lot of towns. After the break, we move to the chef's table where declassified documents reveal Britain secretly funded Reuters in the 1960s and the 1970s. Oh, I got that article from Reuters, by the way. And the U.S. confirmed the avoidable death of Egyptian-American Mustafa Kasem in a prison in Egypt, and he had been incarcerated there since 2013. Why? Because he was protesting during the Arab Spring for more democracy. Throw that man in jail and let him die from a hunger strike. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit.
the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link right there by the social media scroll, by the way. Chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then notice, I hope you will notice the link to our Patreon page and do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. We really need it. And thank you to those who have recently become recurring Patreons of Netroots Radio. Your contribution, your help is so generous and we really are unable to do any of this without you. We are a little powerhouse of resistance and though the bulk of what we do comes out of our own wallets, what you are able to provide really does help us pay our bills and get the needed funds to get the needed machinery that we need. So thank you for your generosity. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. I, of course, take care of at Justice Putnam. Follow me there because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then get that out on social media as well. And you can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. I post show notes and links uh, on there. And you can follow the show on at Cookbook West. And most importantly, pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever fine podcasts can be found mixed in with all the rest of us. All of us. We're there. All right, let's get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Oh, I should mention uh, uh, Heather Parton Digby, you know, from Hullabaloo, has changed her website. She's moved off of Blogspot or, blo- yeah, Blogspot. Been there for, what, 15, 17 years? Gosh, you know, before, during the caveman days of the Internet. <laughs> wow. So, uh Beautiful site, I believe it's on WordPress. And uh, so you should be able to be redirected if you have the bookmark for her old splash page. So just giving you a little heads up, Digby has new digs, and we dig it, indeed. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes out of Reuters by Daniel Wiesner. The Trump administration has made it harder for employees of fast food restaurants or other big franchises to sue corporations when individual franchise owners violate wage laws, a step that was a top priority for business groups. You know, most of all, most of the economic strategies these businesses uh, prevail or uh, rely upon, (laughs) something wrong with my mouth today. What they rely upon is figuring out ways to not pay taxes, how to cheat their workers and not leave a paper trail. Okay, Actually, they wish that they could just cheat their workers and the paper trail wouldn't matter anyway. But uh, they really hate being looked at. So I know what. This whole franchise model is, it's to socialize liability. That's right. You're a capitalist when you're reaping the profits because they bring in big time money from these franchises. And every single one of these franchises have to look like the corporate model. And they have rules from the corporation about how an individual restaurant franchise can behave, can act, who they can buy from in terms of their supplies, the recipe, even down to the software for their payroll. But you make it a franchise because it's sort of like a limited liability corporation. You're trying to get some separation from other people so you're not held culpable for their crimes, but also for your crimes. The rule takes effect in March and should help franchisers who have been sued by workers in recent years for wage law violations by franchisees. 
McDonald's Corporation has faced a series of high-profile lawsuits claiming it is a so-called joint employer of franchise workers. The company won a major victory in October when a federal appeals court in San Francisco said McDonald's was not liable for alleged wage law violations by a franchise owner. In 2017, the department repudiated legal guidance from the Obama administration that had expanded circumstances in which a company could be considered a so-called joint employer under the Federal Labor Standards Act, affectionately known as the FLSA. Labor Secretary Eugene Scalia, why does that name sound familiar? Uh-huh. There's some original intent in that nepotism, isn't there? Labor Secretary Eugene Scalia, in a statement, said the rule furthers President Donald Trump's effort to address regulations that hinder economic growth, and we don't use the P-word at Netroots, Netroots Radio because we are precluded for, from doing so by our uh, style manual. But because this is Eugene Scalia making the statement, I had to put it in, because we know where his loyalty lay or lies. By giving... Greater clarity to businesses who want to work together, we promote an entrepreneurial culture that has driven American prosperity for decades, Scalia said. Unions and, la and worker advocacy groups had opposed the rule after the Labor Department proposed it last April. The union-backed National Employment Law Project said that the rule would allow companies to avoid liability even when they have some control over working conditions and would prevent many workers from recouping pay they are owed under the FLSA. The rule returns to an earlier four-part test under which companies are considered joint employers only if they hire, fire, and supervise employees, set pay, and maintain employment records. That would likely exclude many franchisors and companies that hire contract labor. The Obama administration's guidance included several other factors, such as the nature of the work being performed and whether workers were integral to a company's business. The business community complained that approach threatened the franchise business model and would lead to a spike in lawsuits. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, once you got it, you're never going to get rid of it. Robert Crisanti, president of the International Franchise Association, a trade group, <laughs> said in a statement, the Obama-era guidance was one of the nation's most harmful economic regulations bleh, and had nearly doubled the number of lawsuits filed against franchise businesses. Well, stop breaking the law. Jeez. <laughs> he finally set up some, some protocols to be able to catch you in the act. Of course lawsuits are going to go up. The Obama-era regulation was not legally binding. Unlike the rule released on Sunday, that could make it more difficult for future administrations to undo, but also could open it up to legal challenges. The National Labor Relations Board is moving to roll back a separate Obama-era standard for determining joint employment under federal labor law, which governs union organizing and workers' rights to advocate for better working conditions. And why? Because everything the black guy did has to be erased, just like off the obelisk in ancient Egypt itself. Offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, is by anonymous worker bees and Reuters. The Democratic chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee said he was disappointed and frustrated that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had declined to testify at a committee hearing on Iran set for today. 
Each passing day raises new questions about the strike that killed General Soleimani. Was there really an imminent threat? Was it part of a larger operation? What was the legal justification? What is the path forward, the committee's chairman, Representative Elliot Engel, said in a statement. The Democratic-led committee. Well, yeah, come on, Reuters. You can call them the majority, all right? You don't need to, I don't know, this is almost like a pejorative. We don't have really any standing here because it's Democratic-led. We're the majority. The Republicans are the minority. Look at your style manual. Oh, you changed that from the Reuters Trust back in the day? We'll see. All right, well, I'll just read it how they put it. The Democratic-led committee said last week it had called Pompeo to testify as members of Congress Congress pushed Trump's administration for more information about the killing of top Iranian military commander Qasem Soleimani. The State Department declined to comment. The House on Thursday last passed largely along party lines a resolution that would stop Trump from further military action against Iran, rebuking Trump as mostly Democratic members of Congress expressed frustration at the administration's shifting explanations for the strike on Iraqi soil against the Iranian. There has been no announcement of when the measure might come up for a vote in the Senate because that's where everything from the House goes to die in Moscow Mitch's graveyard, don't you know? Engel said his committee, which oversees the State Department, hoped to hear from Pompeo soon. Well, you know, even when they get voted out of office at the end of this debacle, people still go to jail. Look at John Mitchell. Israel of the American Independent brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Two Wisconsin state legislators introduced a bill to force presidential campaigns to pay for local government security costs for their rallies. The bill specifically cites outstanding debts incurred by Trump's campaign which has left local governments across the country to shoulder hundreds of thousands of dollars in security costs for his events. The Recovery of Unsettled Municipal Payments Act, proposed by State Senator Jeff Smith, a Democrat, and State Representative Amanda Strzok, also Democratic members, would prohibit a presidential or vice president presidential campaign with outstanding bills from receiving a permit for another event until all debts are paid. It would also allow Wisconsin's municipalities to charge campaigns for police and sanitation in advance. The press release, the two noted uh, that both or in the press release, the two noted that both the cities of Eau Claire and Green Bay, Wisconsin, still have Outstanding bills for presidential campaigns from the 2016 uh, election, with the biggest offender being the Trump campaign. As of Sunday, they added, the two are owed a combined uh, $56,778 for 2016 Trump rallies. This is part of the larger pattern of rally and ditch by Trump's campaign. As of June... Of 2019, 
The Center for Public Integrity reported that he owed more than $841,000 combined to at least 10 local police forces that provided security for his rallies. More than 470,000 of that is owed by the city or is owed to the city of El Paso, Texas, where Trump held an event last April to promote his plans for an expensive border wall. Well, of course, Trump's uh, argument against being charged or we have to pay these bills is that by them charging him, it is an infringement upon free speech. It infringes his free speech. All rules never apply to this guy. Asked about the bills and debts, a Trump 2020 campaign spokesman said in an email that the U.S. Secret Service, not the campaign, coordinates with local law enforcement for the protection of the President of the United States. The campaign itself does not contract with local governments for police involvement. All billing inquiries should always go to the U.S. Secret Service, and no, that's not how it works. The Secret Service is protecting the President of the United States, just as they protect other candidates for public office as President. Once that's been shaken out and determined, all they all get Secret Service protection. The Secret Service does not pay for campaigns security. The campaign pays for those third parties to provide the services. The Secret Service is not billed for that. Does the Secret Service get billed for Trump's uh, Burger King obsession? Because they protect the president? Not when he's campaigning, let's be clear. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world. And we are going to finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Sunday morning, September 28, 1969, a fireball lit up the skies north of Melbourne, Australia. And people were getting ready to go to church, and then they heard this loud sonic boom. Uh, some of them saw the bright fireball in broad daylight, and people were surprised. They was what's going on? Especially those who were not outside, they realized, oh, is there an airplane that came down? It sounded really dramatic. And then suddenly, shortly after that, there was a smell that was detectable over the whole area. People describe it as methylated spirits, so strong uh, organic smell. Cosmochemist Philip Heck of Chicago's Field Museum describing the spectacular arrival of what's now known as the Murchison Meteorite, named for the village where it was found. A portion of the space debris now resides at the Field Museum, and Heck says it's our best source of pre-solar stardust, meaning stardust older than the solar system and the sun itself. I call it a scientific treasure trove. <laughs> Inside the meteorite is dusty debris, left over from when stars slightly larger than our sun fizzled out. Over millions of years, those dust grains were battered by cosmic rays, which slightly altered their composition. Atoms of elements got broken down into smaller ones, like neon and helium, and then some of that stardust was swallowed up within rocks, such as the Murchison meteorite, during the formation of our solar system. Those rocks served as time capsules, preserving the material for unimaginable ages. Previous astronomical observations have hypothesized that there was a baby boom of stars about 7 billion years ago. By studying the Murchison grain's elemental composition, Heck's team was able to date 49 grains and found that two-thirds of them were 4.6 to 4.9 billion years old. And that all makes sense because the parent stars, they formed 7 billion years ago, and it took them about 2 to 2.5 billion years to evolve, become planetary nebula, and become dust-producing. The results are in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Some of the grains are actually up to 7 billion years old, making them the most ancient material on Earth. Delivered here without notice on a quiet Sunday morning 50 years ago. 
Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1868. Representatives from more than 40 locals of the International Union of Bricklayers of North America gathered in New York City. It was the third annual convention of the new union. Members of Local 4 from New York City came to the convention to push for support for the eight-hour day. They also called upon the other unions to stand with their local if they went out on strike to win the eight-hour day. After the Civil War, the idea of an eight-hour workday had increasingly become a rallying cry for workers. Skilled craftsmen, such as bricklayers, would help to lead the charge. In 1910, Johns Hopkins University published a report on the bricklayers' contribution to this important labor struggle. According to their report, the convention decided not to press the eight-hour question at that time. Although the resolution for the eight-hour day had not become a part of the union's formal platform, there was growing member support for the cause. That year, Local 4 went out on strike to win the eight-hour day. They were joined by New York Locals 2 and 12. The young union had little experience with leading such an action. But as the report points out, the workers were, quote, routed in all but went to pieces. The flame of the idea of the eight-hour workday continued to spread across the international. By the next year's convention, it had caught fire. The resolution for the eight-hour workday was adopted and became an official demand of the Bricklayers' Union. Four years later, the New York locals again went out on strike. This time, the more experienced unions found success. And as the report concluded, in just one day, the men won the shorter day on their own terms. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. Six of the still-standing candidates for the Democratic nomination take the stage Tuesday night, for the final debate before the first official contest of the 2020 presidential race, the Iowa caucuses, which are set for February 3rd. With the latest Des Moines Register poll, known as the gold standard for this race, showing Bernie Sanders in the lead, the attacks on him are beginning in earnest. Sadly, what unfolded Monday was more proof that the media is exerting undue influence. 
It began with Politico, in typical Politico fashion, publishing a script they say was from the Sanders campaign, instructing volunteers to criticize Elizabeth Warren. The offending section reads, quote, If they are leaning Warren, say, quote, I like Elizabeth Warren, and then optionally, in fact, she's my second choice. But here's my concern about her. The people who support her are highly educated, more affluent people who are going to show up and vote Democratic no matter what. She's bringing no new bases into the Democratic Party. We need to turn out disaffected working class voters if we're going to defeat Trump, end quote. Then Politico ran a follow-up piece quoting Elizabeth Warren as saying she was disappointed that Sanders was sending his volunteers out to trash me, end quote. If that's trashing, I'd hate to see her response when Donald Trump actually does trash her. The Sanders camp denied that this was an official memo from the campaign, while Warren began fundraising off of it. Then CNN did, as CNN does, and they jumped in the fray with a story by MJ Lee claiming, quote, Bernie Sanders told Elizabeth Warren in private 2018 meeting that a woman can't win. Sanders denied it in a statement, reading, quote, It's ludicrous to believe that at the same meeting where Elizabeth Warren told me she was going to run for president, I would tell her that a woman couldn't win. What I did say that night was that Donald Trump is a sexist, a racist, and a liar who would weaponize whatever he could. Do I believe a woman can win in 2020? Of course. After all, Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump by three million votes in 2016. But later in the day, Warren issued a statement with her account of the meeting saying, quote, I thought a woman could win. He disagreed. On Monday night, the Washington Post reported what should be the final word on the subject. Two people with knowledge of the conversation at this 2018 dinner at Warren's home told the Washington Post that Warren brought up the issue by asking Sanders whether he believed a woman could win. One of the people said Sanders did not say a woman couldn't win, but rather that Trump would use nefarious tactics against the Democratic nominee. Senator Cory Booker has officially ended his presidential bid, announcing Monday that due to a lack of funds, he'd be exiting the race. Well, deja vu all over again, as the New York Times is reporting that Russian military hackers have been boring into the Ukrainian gas company Burisma, yes, the company at the center of the controversy over Joe Biden's son Hunter. While it's not clear what the hackers found or what they were looking for, the experts say, quote, the timing and scale of the attack suggests that the Russians could be searching for potentially embarrassing material on the Bidens, the same kind of information that Mr. Trump wanted from Ukraine when he pressed for an investigation of the Bidens and Burisma, setting off a chain of events that led to his impeachment. The important question being debated now is how the media handles any info coming out of Russian hacks in the 2020 election. We already know what damage they did with hacked info in 2016. Well, if it's Tuesday, it's the start of the next phase of the impeachment of Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi met with her caucus early Tuesday morning. She told the Democrats that the House will take up a resolution appointing impeachment managers on Wednesday. While the White House is pushing the idea of a quick vote to dismiss the impeachment charges, Republicans are now saying they would not go along with that idea. Senator Roy Blunt tweeting that there aren't 51 votes for a motion to dismiss. Across the globe, Iranians have been taking to the streets of Tehran and other cities protesting their government's shooting down of a passenger plane. This in sharp contrast to the brief wave of nationalism on display following the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Attorney General Bill Barr are walking back the claim that Soleimani was killed in response to an imminent threat. They're now saying the move was more for general deterrence. Donald Trump has claimed Soleimani was targeting four embassies before he was killed. Uh, maybe it's time for Congress to investigate. And finally, thousands of teachers packed Florida's state capitol building in Tallahassee Monday to demand billions of dollars in school funding. Florida ranks among the bottom 10 states in funding for students. Union members want what they call a decade of progress. In this case, that amounts to $2.4 billion a year for the next 10 years. Most of this money would go toward education funding, but some of it would also give teachers a 10% pay raise. 
pay was another big sticking point for protesters who said many school staff live below the poverty line. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com. Please click on that donate button. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 35 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of merely 41 to 42 degrees. And that's supposed to be warmer than what we had yesterday. Uh, expecting about, oh, well, about uh, a 15th, no, no, I'm sorry, a quarter of an inch of snow and mixed in with rain. I don't know if this is going to be, okay, snow accumulation of less than one inch. A mix of rain and snow showers throughout the day. Winds will be out of the west southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And that will happen in a few hours because it's pretty calm right now. Tonight, we should be partly cloudy with the winds out of the southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour with some rain and snow overnight. And then tomorrow, we should be shooting up for a high of 45 oh, overnight lows uh, in the upper 20s, by the way. Uh, let's see. Winds will be out of the southeast at five, 10 to 15 miles per hour, so pretty stiff. And it will be bringing, looks like, a quarter inch of rain. So wintery mix all day and tonight and mostly turning into rain with snow tomorrow night. And mostly, and we're supposed to get three inches of snow on uh, Friday. So we'll keep looking to that. Uh, let's see. Pollen is rated at none. The air quality index is in the good range at 32 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is low, though it has ticked up one notch to two. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.01 inches. Visibility is down to four miles. And relative humidity is at 88%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 56 with uh, rain showers and heavy wind. Paris is 54 and cloudy. Rome is 55 and fair. Kiev is 35 and fair. Kabul is 24 degrees with that smoke. Because they burn wood to keep warm, you know, and to cook. Hong Kong is 62 and fair. Tokyo is 48 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 70 degrees and fair. San Francisco, California is 47 and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 42 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere around their property. And these people positively live around the world. Guy Fulkenbridge of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, 
Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. The British government secretly funded Reuters in the 60s and 70s at the behest of an anti-Soviet propaganda unit linked to British intelligence and concealed the funding by using the BBC to make the payments declassified government documents show. The money was used to expand Reuters' coverage of the Middle East and Latin America and hidden by increased new subscription payments to Reuters from the BBC. We are now in a position to conclude an agreement providing discreet government support for Reuters services in the Middle East and Latin America, according to a redacted 1969 British government uh, document marked Secret, and entitled Funding of Reuters by HMG. HMG's interest should be well served by the new arrangement, said the document, which was declassified last year. HMG stands for Her Majesty's Government. The extent of influence, of any, that the government was able to exert over Reuters news in return for the money is unclear from the documents, which detail a 1969 secret British government government financing deal for Reuters. However, the documents illustrate the level of involvement the government once had in Reuters affairs and the explicit agreement to conceal the financing. I should add very quickly that uh, Reuters did uh, change what they call their trust principles and that any of the activities the government had embarked on back in the day would not be allowed under their new trust principles. And uh, Reuters is out of Canada now, so there is that. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Anonymous worker bees out of Reuters bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The United States confirmed the death of Egyptian American Mustafa Kasem in a prison in Egypt where he had been in custody since 2013 and vowed to continue raising concerns over Cairo's human rights record. Egypt's state prosecutor said Kasem died in a Cairo hospital on Monday, saying in a statement an autopsy had been ordered to determine the cause of death. The prosecutor said Kasem had been transferred on Sunday from a jail hospital to the Cairo University Hospital. Kasem, who had been on a liquid-only hunger strike to protest his conviction, stopped taking liquids last Thursday and uh, a rights group, Pretrial Rights International, said in a statement, the group said it was representing Kasem and his family and also said that Kasem died on Monday, yesterday, in a hospital. Kasem was sentenced to prison in September of 2018 with dozens of others over a 2013 sit-in that ended with security forces killing hundreds of protesters. The sentencing, which included jail terms for more than 600 others, concluded a mass trial of people accused of murder and inciting violence during the protest at Raba Adewiwa Square in Cairo. And, of course, Washington is Cairo's closest Western ally and one of its top aid donors because Trump just loves him some CC. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TF Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 